Water scarcity affects every continent on our planet. Nearly one third of people already live in water stressed regions. By 2025, it's likely closer to be two thirds. I'm Ariana Khan. I'm an organizer and environmental scientist. See it or not, water scarcity is impacting you right now. The food you eat, the power in your home, and even the brands you use every day are all part of a complicated ecosystem that runs on water. Like the rest of us, water is essential for PNG. It's needed to make all and use most of their products. That's why they're helping to build a water positive future and sending me on a journey to learn more about the ripple effect of good ecosystems, people, and communities that come from the projects they're supporting. Now it's our turn to take care of this river. Restoration is our religion. It's our belief system. It's who we are. It's why, as Yurok, we believe that without humans being part of the world around us, the world itself is out of balance. We believe we belong here, that humans belong here on Earth, and our role is to create a balance in the ecosystems we live in. We've seen what a hundred years of extraction has done to this planet, and we think the next hundred years should be built on giving back to it. So what is the specific purpose of this slough that we are standing by? One of the primary goals is um, habitat for juvenile winter run Chinook. Basically, it's a baby fish nursery. The winter run Chinook salmon are endangered here in California. And now with the dams, there's just not enough habitat for the salmon. Because the main stem is kind of a hostile environment for baby fish, we need to create these side channel habitats so that they can rear here until they're ready to go out to the ocean. We did, I think about two miles of work starting here and, and going up. It was about 30 acres of restoration we did. So uh, we're down here today uh, checking on the riparian work. Yeah. Wait, so, hold on. What is riparian habitat? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> riparian habitat refers to the plant community that lives next to okay. the river, right? And um, so what we do today, since um, after the Eurox reset the channel, we go in with the keystone species of restoration. Would you like to plant a willow? Yes. <laughs> these species help to you know maintain the integrity of the channel willows especially will help shade the water so that when the salmon come up that they can find cool water for shade and they'll actually bring up the water table and and help to retain the water in here We've planted 56 species in this area, um, which is also really important because biodiversity is kind of like a ecological insurance policy. This is the largest constructed channel habitat for juvenile salmon of its kind on the Sacramento River. And there's a lot of challenges that you run into on a project this big that you don't know are coming at the onset. Underground utilities, bridge reinforcement project, early rains, dewatering the sluice, and now we're dealing with beaver dams and you know a low water year, making it difficult for us to establish the plantings. Yeah. So corporate partner funding and PNG funding was really important and became like ever more so critical as the project went on to bridge funding gaps that you don't know are going to happen at the onset of a project like this. What does success look like for this project? As soon as we connected the channel, as soon as the water started flowing, there were baby salmon in here. So, you know, we consider that a success. The East San Slough showed me that while bringing more water into the ecosystem can seem simple, it has interconnected benefits from plants to fish, even at this early stage. But I wanted to know how a project like this can actually start addressing the water crisis on a much larger scale. There are a series of projects along the Sacramento River, including the Brayton Restoration Project, that has been established over the past decade. So I want to check one out. Well, I'm John Kane. Uh, I'm the conservation director with River Partners, mm -hmm. and we're here on the banks of the Sacramento River. This is one third of the water supply of the state of California comes from the Sacramento River. 
And when settlers first came to California, the Sacramento River would overflow its banks every year and flood vast areas. Mm -hmm. They used to call it an inland sea. So that didn't work out very well for early farmers after the gold rush, and they started building these levees. And that was good for agriculture, but it was really a problem for fish and wildlife over time. So it seems the riparian ecosystem, like restoration here, has holistic benefits. Um, what is the particular goal of this property? This property that we're at, we like to call it a string of pearls. It's uh, five different properties that are marginal agricultural land along the Sacramento River to restore them for habitat, for birds and fish, and also to reduce flood risk for the neighboring community of Calusa. River Partners is really dependent on private contributors. Mm -hmm. Procter & Gamble has uh, played a key part in funding our Brayton project, which is the most upstream project What's happening at the Brayton Project? The Brayton Project is very similar to where we are here. It used to be a walnut orchard. The walnut orchard was no longer viable because it was getting flooded. Mm -hmm. And so we replaced the walnut orchard with native vegetation. Okay, if you want to get in front first. Okay, whichever doesn't make me steer. How does this project facilitate water conservation? The first thing is, Generally, the land that we're buying along the river and restoring to native habitat is irrigated agriculture. We stop the irrigation on the property and we replace the irrigated crops with native vegetation that use less water. Mm -hmm. So we, right away, we reduce what's called the evaporative demand for water. Another thing that the projects do for water is groundwater recharge. As we have more fluctuating climate, we can expect more cycles of drought and flood. And so during flood times, we have more room for the river to spread out and recharge the groundwater. And then during drought times, we have more groundwater banked for use by the farmers. And so I think there's a realization that these projects provide benefits for everyone in the community. Do you think that people having access to the nature here is a point of hope? I definitely know that seeing our restoration projects is a point of hope because they grow so quickly. One project we did 20 years ago is now a forest 100 feet tall. Wow. But water doesn't just support riverbanks, animals, and recreation. About 70% of the world's water goes into agriculture. My grandparents are farmers, and I know that growing crops is all about irrigation. So I wanted to talk to some people who have been working with the water and the land for generations to get their take on how to protect their resources and their community at the same time. Without water, all of this farming that you see here, it really wouldn't be possible. We really rely on the Colorado River. It's the lifeblood of this entire valley, and so we try to account for every single drop of it when we can. My name is Josh Moore. I'm the general farm manager here at Crit Farms on the Colorado River Indian Reservation. I'm a native to the area. I'm a member of the tribe. My heritage, I'm Hopi, Mojave, and Chemehuevi. So you have a very deep connection to the land. Yeah, yeah. So it's really interesting. Uh, you know, almost on both sides of my family, I had grandfathers that worked this valley for, for generations. I grew up here on the reservation. I interned at this farm in college, and uh, luckily I had the ch opportunity to come back, and now I manage the farm. What we're going to do is we're going to walk down this line right here and you'll see there's those turnout gates there. We'll make sure that each of them are shut. So that way when we uh, put water in the system, water is stopped in this canal before it goes out into the fields. How big is this farm? Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty large farm. Altogether in Arizona and California, I'm responsible for about 27,000 acres. Right now, you know, we, we realize that this tradition of flood irrigation that we've used here is something that we probably can't do for a whole lot longer. And so here on Crit Farms, we're working at looking for alternative methods and technologies to help us kind of turn away from that so that we can survive for more generations as farmers. Actually, a lot of fungi. Nice. Yeah. What are we looking at here? So this is an example of what you would probably see in 70% of this valley. This is an alfalfa field. And I think this does a good visualization of showing you that almost all of this land here is under flood irrigation. 
We're working on trying to um, upgrade our irrigation systems to be far more efficient and specifically only provide the water directly to the plants where they need it. It's a microgravity drip irrigation system. The system is cool because it's cost effective and you know, can be utilized worldwide wherever there's, there's uh, arid lands. So we're doing this as a pilot project. In the context of like, the local communities and the tribes here, why is this project exciting? I mean, it's innovative as heck, but why is it exciting? Yeah, the exciting thing is, is uh, there's a lot of benefit and proven and documented benefit to utilizing drip irrigation. Um, some studies show that by converting to drip irrigation, you can increase your yield. And so we're really excited about the opportunity to kind of you know bring this smart farming technology not just to this field but to all you know as many of our fields as, as we can economically do. This project was born out of a goodwill effort to bring in this irrigation change project and one of our, our big partners is the Bonneville Environmental Foundation who are helping not only match funds but kind of reinforce and strengthen the work that we're doing on our system improvements here. The paradigm of innovation just keeps rolling and it's, it's awesome. And the biggest thing is it's gonna take so many different solutions to keep this valley in production. I'm excited that I get to be a part of that. While clearly it takes a lot of people to make these projects happen, I still want to know what PNG's actual role is on the projects that create ripples of good and why they were willing to send me on this journey in the first place. I'm Shannon Quinn. I'm the Global Water Stewardship Leader for Procter & Gamble. and. We're here to talk about water today and the challenges and the solutions that we're working towards. Mm -hmm. I'm Todd Reeve, I'm the CEO of the Bonneville Environmental Foundation and we work with many companies like Procter & Gamble, helping them connect to water solutions and partners on the ground to help achieve impacts and benefits for communities and wildlife. Okay, so what does a corporation have to do with water, especially a corporation like P&G? For Procter & Gamble, water is essential. We need it to manufacture our products and then people need water to use our products at home. So it's, it's really essential that we protect it and we protect it for the people who need our products but also for the wildlife and the environment and, and others. Coming from a generation dealing with the brunt of climate crisis and evil practices from corporations, um, we're a little skeptical to hear uh, when corporations step in uh, for solutions. So. What are you guys actually doing? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Procter & Gamble is a comprehensive strategy to address water across the life cycle of our products. We are focusing on 18 watersheds. We really looked at where we were having an impact but could also have the biggest positive impact. And then within each of those basins, we're working on developing a portfolio of projects that really address the challenges that we found there. We really wanna to work to not only restore water through these projects, but have these other amazing benefits come from them. You know, benefits to community, to wildlife, to uh, to people. We're also looking at inside of the four walls of our manufacturing plants, what is it that we can do to reduce water use and improve efficiency? And then we're also um, working on uh, moving from just, you know, 500 liters of water being used in homes on average per day to, to how does that, how do we make that 50? liters per day and we do that with in, in partnership with others in the 50 liter home coalition. And one thing that's really unique is the Cascade brand came in early and saw an opportunity as they were rethinking some of their strategies about how they reduce water use in the home um, at the same time participating in projects with the Colorado River Indian tribes and in other states as well. And so a really unique example of a brand stepping up and generating influence around water conservation in the home while at the same time partnering with a tribe, partnering with other nonprofit groups to help support projects on the ground that are conserving water, restoring water for the environment, for communities. Why do you need a brand at the scale of PNG to do this sort of work? Bringing companies to the table on these water issues is something that didn't happen historically. And if you talk to water managers and water agencies, they'll say, companies weren't at the table, right, when we were discussing water. And I think it is an incredibly powerful component of this work when these large, very well-known companies come in and start participating, right? Everybody starts paying attention, whether it's a governor or a water agency or a community. That didn't exist 50 years ago. Procter & Gamble serves five billion people every single day using our products. We're in their homes, you know, we're, they're, they're like intimately connected with them. And so we have 
think built this trust and, and have it at this scale that we're able to get these messages out. And so that scale allows us to have that, that larger impact. I mean, personally, I agree with that, understanding the nuances of how solutions come about. But I think in, in, our, in our mind, you know, like we inherited this world and we inherited the water crisis. And a lot of big entities were responsible for that before, you know, our arrival. So, um, so I think what will resonate with us is when that messaging ripples into actions and we see that we can also hold different entities like accountable and I mean I also think like you know you have you're the next 50 years right like you're gonna also help like keep moving us in the direction that's needed to solve the problem and just being open-minded and making sure that the people who will be impacted or who could can contribute are at the table and that that includes people that you might not agree with it goes for both parties like yeah. you guys are not gonna agree with everything that yeah. we say and you yeah. know we're totally here for the fight yeah exactly <laughs> yeah and i think also just like continuing to be that voice because companies will hear you especially that collective and you'll you'll start to drive the change but i mean i'm just curious like what would what do you think you're going to tell your friends you know after this journey you've gone on and what you've seen Oh, well, the climate crisis and this water crisis is overwhelming. You know, there are there are solutions that are being scaled in a way that that is going to continuously improve, um, and that we've already like started on that journey. Josh told me that his people had been farming this land for generations, and to hear the true ripple effect on the Colorado River Indian tribes and surrounding communities, he said that there's one more person I have to meet. Inyepamul, Amelia Flores. Makapchadom. Greetings in Mojave. We are sitting on the Colorado River. And what is your relationship to this river? The river is to sustain us, and the river is tied to us through our culture and our spiritual beliefs. And we are part of the river, and we are part of the land. Water rights are essentially what the tribes here are entitled to in order to survive, am I correct? Yes, the Colorado River Indian Tribes has the highest priority and the oldest senior water rights in the lower basin of Arizona. Our allocation of water, which is over 719,000 acre feet of water that we can divert onto our lands, that is what we have today and what we're entitled to and that's our water rights. Um, can you elaborate a bit more, like uh, how water rights affects the way of life for the communities here? We're, we're farmers. We've always been farmers. Uh, and we also lease our, our lands out to um, non-tribal farmers, and we have a handful of tribal farmers. When we lease our land, along with that comes the availability of the water for the crops. Mm -hmm. And with the land lease money, it goes to our general fund. So the general fund goes to the services of our people. The river has always taken care of the people. It's sustaining the life of the Mojave people. It's sustaining the life of the Chemuevi, the Hopi, and Navajo. It's part of our sovereignty as Colorado River Indian tribes. So now it's our turn to take care of this river. I've learned that water affects everything, from the micro to the macro. It affects ecosystems, it affects the soil, and it affects indigenous people as well as communities all around. 